Abdominal pain is probably one of the most common presentations you're going to see in clinical practice. And in this presentation, we're going to look at a way that we can classify abdominal pain into three different categories. Abdominal pain presentations are sometimes really difficult, and they can range from a chronic presentation that's been happening over a number of weeks, months, or even years, but can also happen acutely in that the patient can suddenly have abdominal pain that progresses over minutes, hours, or days. What we can do to help ourselves a little bit in the history taking process is divide these into three broad categories. The first category would be visceral pain, the second would be parietal pain, and the third and final category would be referred pain. Knowing these pain categories and how they can affect the patient, what type of organs can be affected, but also how pain progresses through these stages and through the categories is important in your history taking process. And in this presentation, we're first going to take a look at visceral pain, then parietal pain, and finally referred pain in a little bit more detail. The first category that we're going to take a look at is visceral pain. When patients complain of visceral pain, this is typically a chronic pain that's happening over a certain amount of time, either days or weeks. Patients who complain of visceral pain typically describe it as gnawing, burning, cramping, or aching. Visceral pain itself typically affects hollow organs, such as the intestines or biliary tree, but also be aware that it can affect solid organs such as the liver. However, the important distinguishing factor between it affecting solid and hollow is that in affecting solid organs, it's not the organ itself that is either diseased or causing the patient pain, rather it's the coating or the capsule that is being stretched and therefore the perception of that organ's pain is within that region. The important thing to remember about visceral pain when you're seeing your patients is that it typically radiates to the midline. And what this means is that patients who are describing a visceral pain to you in the history taking process will find it very difficult to localize. And a good way to distinguish between this in clinical practice is to ask the patient to place a single finger on the point that's in pain. Because this pain is difficult to localize, a typical example of visceral pain would be somebody who's having indigestion or heartburn. And what you find is that although this may be located in the esophagus or in the stomach, chances are that your patient describes it in the middle or upper epigastric region. It's difficult to localize, they can't place a single finger on it, and what they'll tend to do is use an open hand gesture to the epigastric region to indicate they're in pain. This is because the visceral pain is affecting the hollow organ, such as the stomach or esophagus. Because visceral pain is poorly localized by the patient and often is presented in the midline, it's really quite challenging to establish which organ is the culprit for causing the patient pain. And as you can see from this figure, patients who experience pain in the epigastric region could actually have pain originating from the biliary tree in terms of it being a hollow organ, but also the liver in terms of hepatomegaly and if it's stretching the capsule causing the patient pain. Likewise, the pain in this region can also be caused from the stomach and duodenum, which are hollow organs, but also the pancreas, which is a solid organ that is surrounded by a capsule as well. And this makes patients who present with visceral pain that materializes in the midline quite difficult to establish which organ it is coming from. Likewise, if your patient complains of umbilical pain, again, organs that could be associated with this are the small intestine, the appendix, or the proximal colon. These are all hollow organs and occupy quite a large area of the abdominal cavity. If we think about the colon, it can also be found in the right flank, the epigastric, and also the left flank region. But because it's visceral pain, it's localized within the midline. Patients may also complain of suprapubic or sacral pain, and this typically presents itself in the suprapubic region. Likewise, you can also get pain from the colon, the bladder, or the uterus here. But often you can find that colon pain can be more diffuse than this and can sometimes even present in the patient's lower back. Because visceral pain is poorly localized by the patient and the areas that are associated with it are quite large and in the midline, it's very difficult to establish which organ the pain is arising from. Patients who experience abdominal pain may also be experiencing parietal pain, and this normally originates from inflammation within the abdominal cavity and is typically associated with the parietal peritoneum, which remember is the fibrous outer covering that houses the abdominal cavities before the musculature and skin. Typically, the parietal pain is more severe than the gnawing, burning or cramping pain associated with visceral pain that we've talked about previously. Normally, these patients will want to be really still in its position as well. And sometimes you might find your patient in the fetal position and they won't want to be laid flat. And this is because it stretches the parietal peritoneum and causes them pain. 
Typically, your patient is able to localize this much more easily than visceral pain. And this is a key point for your pain history with your patient. Try to ask them where the pain actually is and to place a finger on it. As we said previously, if your patient is not able to localize the pain particularly well and it radiates to the midline, chances are that they're experiencing visceral pain from one of the hollow organs or the outer capsular layer. However, if your patient's able to place a finger or identify exactly where the pain is, chances are they're experiencing parietal pain. Another distinguishing factor is you can ask your patient to cough and when you cough your abdominal muscles tense and this exacerbates the pain that they experience from the parietal pain. And also you can inquire with your patient if the pain is relieved by position. Your patient might like to lay in the fetal position or might not like to lay flat and like to sit upright. And this can be a good distinguishing feature between parietal and visceral pain. The important factor here is that visceral pain normally progresses to parietal pain. So chances are, if you've got a patient in parietal pain, they will have experienced visceral pain and nondescript, poorly localized pain before. And ultimately, if they're experiencing parietal pain, it means that their disease or affected organ has progressed and their disease and symptoms are going to worsen. To complicate matters further, not only patients who are experiencing abdominal pain may have visceral or parietal, they may also have referred pain. And this is pain that's felt at different sites. The important factor here for your history taking is that this will be at the same spinal level. For example, pain in the duodenal or pancreatic region will be referred to the same level at the back and pain in the biliary tree or liver will be referred to the right scapular region, which is roughly at the same level as where it would be in the abdomen. Just like visceral and parietal pain, referred pain develops as the initial pain increases. And when you take the history from the patient, you'll find that the referred site initially began perhaps poorly localized, but as the affected organ becomes increasingly diseased and the patient's symptoms increase, the referred pain increases as well. Typically, referred pain is really well localized, and this is seen in those classic examples of pain from the biliary tree to the tip of the right scapular region, or pain from the duodenal or pancreatic region, maybe referred to in the back at the same level. The important thing to remember is that referred pain can happen outside of the abdominal system as well, so that pain can be referred into the abdominal system. Pain can be referred into the abdominal system from the chest, the spine, or the pelvis. And a good example of that is those patients who have inferior MIs sometimes can be referred to the epigastric area and are sometimes mistaken for indigestion. Likewise, some patients who have osteoarthritis of the hips or sacroiliac joints can have pain that's referred to the left or right lower quadrant. And sometimes this is confused with the organs that are associated there. So remember that not only can referred pain go from the abdominal system to other areas of body, but also referred pain can occur from external systems into the abdominal system as well.